We have, as usual, the activity plan, and then we will have only one uh, game jam presentation uh, made by the Wonder Jump 2 team. And lastly, we will have a very interesting talk about intro to concept design for video games made by Daniel Solimene, a concept artist from Farncom, one of our sponsors. So, uh, Paul, are you ready? Yes, I am. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can you answer? Yes. OK, so um, like Danielle said, I'm going to go over uh, what we have um, uh, not so much planned, but uh, prepared to suggest uh, in terms of jams for you to participate in for the month of July. Um, so like the previous month, we'll have uh, four jams. Uh, if you want to participate in this one, in any of these, uh, all you have to do is go to the Looking for Group channel once uh, the, the gems are posted there and react to the, the post with the, um, a specific emoji, which will be assigned to a specific jam to let us know that you're interested in doing that. And then we'll arrange the teams. Um, and then you'll have someone to participate in the gems with and make great games. So um, uh, of these four gems, the first gem um, is uh, uh, the first gem that we, we are suggesting is the Sunofest or Summer Novel Festival 2022. Uh, it'll run from July 1st to September 3rd, so it's uh, it's a quite long, it's two months long, um, and the, the goal here is to make a visual novel or a story-based game. Um, other than that, you don't have any limits. Um, uh, I don't th I'm not sure if uh, there's a, a theme that's also suggested, um, but yeah, you're not very limited uh, as some of the other gems. But from uh, some people in our group participated in this jam last year, and uh, from what I said, it was uh, it was a good experience. So we decided to include it again this year. So any of you writers or artists or I mean programmers as well, everyone, um, if uh, this is what you're looking for, um, then just uh, I think it will be a lot of fun. Uh, next up uh, is the my first game jam. 
so we included this one because we have uh, uh, a lot of newbies um, some are already progressed members but there's uh, still a lot of new people in our group and uh, we thought this was uh, great for them to get a first experience um, in a game jam uh, and learn um, how, how, how you do the games um, what you need to do uh, the whole submission process in each uh, everything that you need to know uh, when you want to participate in the further gems uh, once you stay with us more, uh, uh, more time. Uh, so this one is from July 2nd to July 17th. Uh, the theme was not uh, yet announced, but will be announced uh, right at the start of the jam. So um, that's it for, for the, my first two game jam. Uh, next is Mac Jam 3. Uh, yeah, this one uh, won't have a theme, but um, yeah, you need to include the mecha. Uh, I assume everyone knows what the mecha is, but for those that don't, uh, just imagine a, a giant robot. So, it, for the, the here is where you can fulfill any dreams that you have, like in Pacific Dream or Gundam or uh, any any game where you envision for uh, some giant mech doing something badass. Uh, you can do you can do platformer you can do uh, open world I, I I wouldn't advise because it's not that long of a gem but uh, third person anything as long as it includes giant robots and uh, this one will be from July 8th to July 22nd. Uh, lastly, we are including one of the biggest gems, probably the biggest actually, um, on each. Uh, this is uh, next to the global game jam, probably one of the biggest worldwide. Uh, so big, so uh, so big that um, a lot of times each. Uh, lately, I don't think it happened that much, but each usually freaks out and uh, stops working uh, during the submission process because there are just a huge amount of people trying to submit at the same time. Uh, for right now, there are about thirteen thousand people um, uh, signed up. Uh, of course, not all of them will submit. Uh, this gem is also will also be ranked, a, and with the theme announced at the start of the gem. Um, but yeah, we have participated in this one for the last two years at least, and uh, it's always a good time. Uh, so we included this as well, uh, and it'll be, it'll be from July fifteenth to July seventeenth. Uh, so those are the gems that we are uh, we are suggesting for July. Uh, like I said, I'll make a post on a looking for a group channel and you are able to react to any gem that you want to participate in and then we'll create the teams with other people that are wanting to participate. Um, just lastly, I would like to uh, just give a small shout out. Uh, it will probably be talked later on as well. Um, we will be having a third gathering uh, this year uh, on Monday, June 27th. So it's this Monday in two days, uh, they, uh, in Tax Park, uh, because there will be uh, Moju or Mantra Jogs all day. Uh, we will also be, uh, as game dev, uh, showcasing some games from our wonderful teams. Um, and then after uh, after the, after the Moju, we'll be getting together for to have dinner and uh, play some games and have a good time. Um, so yeah, that's all for the activity plan. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. I have a question for you. Uh, can I participate yes. on the my first game jam, even if it's not my first game jam? Absolutely. So uh, we are we we included it because it may help uh, newer people, but uh, everyone's still allowed to participate. Um, there's no requirement there. Okay. Well, thank you very much for presenting our activity plan. Uh, now, next we will have the presentation with the Wonder Jam 2 team. Are you guys ready? Yes, I'm a team of one person. <laughs> hey, hey. Go ahead. I, hopefully it wasn't the team for the jam with one no, person. No, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, hopefully you can see the screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Fabio, and I will be presenting our participation in Wonder Jam 2. I participated along in Barnes and Mars. Wonder Jam 2 is a 10-day long jam, 
uh, that team this year was an idol, uh, and most of you know that's my favorite genre of games. Uh, so I was very excited to make this one. When we all got together to for an idea, these were all the four main uh, ideas for making a, uh, an idol game. So a civilization builder, a dungeon explorer, where you create your own army, uh, idle tower defense, and business management. So we decided to take all of these ideas and put it into one game. And then uh, the idea that we got was a hero that travels around the world uh, and just kills enemies. And the difficulty and structures are defined by the player. So we made an, uh, a game on the other way around. So instead of the player controlling the hero, the player only controls everything else around the, the hero. So it can only control how hard, they, how hard the enemies are and what structures appear while the, the, the hero is traveling. And the hero is always talking to the player because the player only makes things harder for the hero. In terms of our concept, uh, we decided to go with a simple look. So the enemy, the, the player is always, the hero is always on the same place and the enemy just keep coming at it. Uh, the en each enemy has a chance of dropping a card and cards can be either an hospital for the player to heal the hero or ch shops for the hero to spend money and buy new items such as weapons, armor, potions, etc. Since we didn't have, uh, since we were a team of four programmers, we didn't have an artist. We decided to use the best uh, asset creation tool that there is, which is Paint, and we made this amazing, uh, cool-looking game of simple, <laughs> simple art, but it it fits really well with how strange and simple the the concept of a game is. As you can see, we have a reference to GDT here, a GDT sword, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, in terms of the game look, we have the world, and the enemy spawn. An enemy spawns every two seconds, and they have a chance of dropping a card, and it can be placed around the world. Uh, in terms of development, what everyone did. So Eduardo took care of everything that was related to AI. They took care of the building system and Tomas take care of the uh, card system. Looking back at the at the game and what we did, uh, the positives of the game was it is easily expendable. So right now we don't have a lot of enemies or a lot of cards and weapons or the world really. So one of the, our, our ideas which we, was for the Euro to travel around the world so we could have different environments, different types of shops enemies and a lot of variety of weapons so right now we only have a weapon shop but our initial idea was to have a potion shop a armor shop and all those shops that can bring a lot of variety to the game uh, and obviously the unique art style and animation that our game is that you will see in a bit when i play the game uh, the negatives was the game is not finished and it's not really balanced and some of the features are not easy to understand and since we don't have a tutorial for the game. So that's it. And now I'm going to play the game. So now you will see how it actually plays out. So is there, we, we can see uh, we have the player and it makes a really interesting animation to kill the the enemies and every now and then they have a chance to drop a card right now this is an unfortunate one because the is almost dead and i don't have an hospital card oh, here we are. so here a shop, a shop opens and the the hero itself decides what it wants to buy so now i'm dead so i cannot play anymore 
but yeah, this is pretty much it of the the game. Uh, but the really interesting part, or the most interesting part here, is every time we start the the game or a new game, uh, the hero will have a, a a different personality. So when it goes to buy an item, it will choose different items. So the hero doesn't always choose the optimal or what should be the best in slot item. It, it chooses uh, the items based on the severity of factors that are defined when the game starts. So here it chooses th this one because it might be because it has the most damage or because it's the mo one most affordable. But someone, but sometimes the the hero can also choose uh, an item that because the name looks pretty cool or the item is really pretty and not based on damage or anything else. So as you can see, we have this sexy dagger, which is like a damage of one, but there's a sexiness of a thousand. So if uh, if uh, the hero starts the game with uh, interest in sexiness for weapons, it will mostly buy that one, even though it only does one damage. Uh, and here we have a button of the level up enemy, so we can control the, le the level of the enemy, and the higher it goes, the more health they have, and the more uh, uh, money they give. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I have a question uh, about the objective of the game. Uh, is the player uh, the one that that is playing like a partnership with the uh, with the character with the main character, or he wants the main character to lose the the game? No. So it has to figure. So it depends on the objective of the player. So each player can. We have, we give the freedom for the player to decide if he wants or not for the the hero to die. So he is not playing against him, but nor nor is playing with him. So our initial idea was when the the game starts and the player keeps making enemies harder, so they drop rarer loot and give more money, but are also harder to defeat. And the hero is always mocking the player about it, so because he doesn't want to make the game harder, but it the player makes the game harder in order for the player to progress. Since our initial idea we have the game have an ending, and in order to defeat that ending, the the, the hero itself needed to be strong. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, firstly, thank you very much for your presentation, Fabio. Uh, secondly, I'm not sure if you explained it at the beginning, but it's kind of an important thing. Uh, what is an idle game? Oh, oh God, I could make an hour presentation about it. <laughs> But like an idle game is a, a game that comes to a point where the game plays itself. Um, but on the basis is it come the idle games come from is a, like a subcategory of a clicker game, which is a game where we perform a really really simple task uh, in order to see the, most of the games are to see a number grow, but in order to progress the game. You just need to perform a, a very simple task. So in here, our idle game, we could see that it's not, it's almost idle since the game plays itself. You don't have to do anything, but you don't, if you don't do anything, the hero will eventually die because he runs out of health. Okay, thank you very much, Fabio. And uh, I think that concludes this part of the schedule. So uh, next up, we have the presentation by Danielle. Are you ready? Hi. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, can I just share the screen for now? Yes. Okay. Slideshow. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Daniele. I'm from Italy. Uh, Milan, if you've ever been there. Uh, I am 26 and I've been working for Funcom for almost three years now. Uh, and I guess working professionally for 
about four, even though I don't know if it counts because it was shitty self-funded projects <laughs> like myself. Uh, to give you a quick story of my education, which is quite a mess, honestly, like I graduated high school in 2015. Uh, then, of course, I guess Milan. Uh, Italy is pretty similar to Portugal in that regard. There's not really a culture about video game education yet. So big universities don't take that seriously. We just have private courses. I still went to the Fine Arts Academy in Milan, and I studied scenography, which uh, seemed to be like the closest thing to what I had to do, just because it was about set design, and there was some television and film industry involved. But it was super, super basic, and the teacher was super outdated, like teaching stuff. It could have been the 70s, that's what I'm trying to say. So I dropped out, and uh, I convinced my parents to go to this digital art school in Milan, where they would teach you the basics of 3D softwares, Photoshop, and stuff. But it wasn't really the best in terms of uh, teaching the theory about uh, concept art and really what I wanted to do. So that was two years I finished. Uh, it wasn't super expensive either, but at least I had something to, go, to do in the meantime. And uh, then I found out about this other school that is in Poland, in Dansk. It's called Focal Point School, and it's actually run by two veteran, as they say, concept artists. Um, that one is actually also pretty cheap. And uh, it was super cool because uh, it gave me like, all the foundations that I needed to get into this industry and have a decent portfolio to actually present to, to industries. Um, okay. I'm super sorry, guys. I need to go for 30 seconds to bring in the door. I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I'll go back. Don't worry. I guess we're quite lucky that here at Technical, we do have uh, video game scars. I'm really sorry again. I'm back. Don't worry. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, then Focal Point School was amazing. I got a portfolio and I did a bunch of networking as well. And uh, it gave me the portfolio that I actually used to apply to Fancom in Portugal, which at the time was still ZPX, uh, like a smaller indie company that was then afterwards acquired by Fancom. Uh, and that was 2019 at the time. And this is just our station page as a reference. And I started working on Conan Exiles, even though I was hired to work on another project, which got later canceled like two days after I joined. So and it was supposed to be sci-fi World War II setting and all that. But of course they put me working on a more stylized fantasy game, like the complete opposite. Uh, I met a lot of wonderful people that were working at the studio at the time. So it was really cool to work on such a project. Uh, if you don't know it, it's a survival game set in the world of Conan. So there's lots of uh, building and surviving and gathering resources and that kind of stuff. Lots of monsters, cool stuff to design. Uh, but then finally, in 2021, they switched most of the people working at the studio to the new upcoming Doom project which what is what, what, what I was really looking forward to since the day I joined. They, they knew already they were working on the game since a couple of years, but the team was really small. But actually, after they figured out some stuff in pre-production, they actually started moving people over. And that was really the, the start of the cool experience I'm having right now. And the studio really grew a lot. Like it went from 25 people to now actually around 80, just in Lisbon. And the studio is also in Oslo. and. North Carolina and Romania. And uh, it feels like I moved somewhere else to work in another studio, but in the meantime, I always stay in Lisbon, which is cool. Uh, what else? Then 
yeah, I, I guess I can't really talk much about the game because it will be announced uh, in the next months, I think. So the point of this presentation that I wanted to give is really try to give a good definition of what concept design, concept art is, whatever you want to call it, and uh, clearing things out, uh, but also have a good indication of the skills and the type of training necessary to start working in this industry. Uh, and by that, I guess we need to ask this question first. Uh, what is not concept art? What isn't concept art? And very often people that are approaching to this world don't really have a, a very precise idea of what concept art actually is. They might put, put it in the same boxes as different types of digital art, just because videos and techniques are very similar. And for example, splash arts, uh, book market illustrations, or even, I don't know, generic digital art studies that people do to improve their technique in digital paintings. Uh, they share the medium, as I was saying, but, uh, and they're one, wonderful by any means, but uh, they come at the end of a research process, a design process, and someone uh, has, or, or, or even a team of people has designed those things from scratch before making a super polished, beautiful illustration out of it. So what is actually concept art now? Uh, and it's essentially design. Uh, in Italian, we have this word, which uh, is basically the same as the Portuguese one, progetto, which means creating something from scratch with a schedule in mind, uh, referencing other ideas if necessary or things from the real world, uh, existing references and influences. Uh, and in the pre-production phase, like when, people get together and like in a game jam, they just discuss the game and uh, think what it could be, what visuals uh, they could go for and so on. Uh, this is what they call it world building in the sense that they're literally creating a fictional world that is coherent in itself. And that contributes to create that famous uh, suspension of disbelief element uh, in, in more uh, expanded games, I guess, like bigger ones that really try to create an immersive experience. But even in smaller uh, mobile games, something that has a, a visual aspect to it, uh, it's always important to have a coherent world that you're building, even if it doesn't even have a story. Uh, so, and the concept art is really just the first step in creating the visual facade of a game. Otherwise, it would just be, uh, like a game designer version of it, like with moving gray boxes. And it might have the best mechanics and the best gameplay ever, but it's still something very niche that people that are really interested in games as an abstract thing would play. Otherwise, this is what makes it uh, juicy for the market, let's say it like that. Um, so, and some mobile games or simulators don't even need this professional figure at all. I mean, the concept artist, uh, like as, as you guys were presenting before, some mobile games, if, if you try to put it on mobile or just keep it as a small game, they don't even need uh, anything else but a small team of coders and designers. Or some other teams, like even bigger studios have, uh, they're just doing simulators. Like, I don't know, the farming simulator or even MotoGP or Formula One games. Uh, they're just trying to replicate reality as uh, best as possible. There's this studio in Milan called Milestone. They just do, uh, it's actually one of the main studios in Italy, and they just do MotoGP simulators. They don't, obviously, they don't have a concept art department. They outsource all the 3D modelers from, I guess, Poland, Ukraine, and so on. And they just have game designers and audio people and technicians of that type. And they just put the game together and they have to just create blueprints and ship the whole thing and coders. So uh, these were just random examples of uh, very good designers. Uh, character design, as you see, like it's not just related to the costume, like it translates into patterns and what might be the ships of these type of people, how could the cities look, and it's all uh, taken from bits and pieces of real world uh, references, but they're mixed in a different way and they look original and uh, 
from another world in a sense. Uh, so now I will just try to have like a a short list of the main uh, categories of concept artwork. Uh, it's a super condensed list actually, and there are more subcategories and specializations, but I tried to at least mention the biggest ones. And uh, I will try to bring a couple of technique examples for each one of those to show you that there's not really a hard set of requirements to the work. You don't need to know 3D at a super high level if you want, if you can communicate your designs well. And uh, if you can do it with drawing and digital paintings or other similar techniques, you don't really need to know 3D at all. I have colleagues that don't know how to use it just because they're amazing with pure drawing and painting. Uh, but let's say just 3D makes things easier. Uh, so yeah, character design. This type of work is actually something a bit less technical that, than what I was showing you before, but uh, it's more like in the pitching phase. You know, Maybe they're trying to establish a faction in the game and they just go for a fast sketches like these ones, they don't really need to show how all these things are built and how they would work in 3D. It's, it's more like pitching an idea for these characters. Uh, but then you have something made in 3D, and this is actually for the Dune movie done by Joseph Cross. And, uh, and this is just the front page, like this thing could go on for like seven more pages explaining how the steel suit is built and how the shoes are and there are a tons of references from contemporary fashion design and uh, and of course many other areas of technologies and so on so just to show you what i was telling you like this is complete line art almost comic book art and this is like super advanced 3d with at least three softwares involved just because it's for the movie industry i guess and then creature design again this was done for the latest god of war and you think a huge uh, AAA studio, uh, they could have anyone working for them, the craziest uh, artist uh, technicians ever, but they still require people to be able to uh, draw stuff with pencil and paper just because it's easier and it's faster. This guy is really good at it, Stefan Oakley. I tried to put all the names on, on one corner of the page if you guys want to look at it. Uh, but then again, later you get the same type of people doing maybe models in 3D, in 3D just because they're good at it and they might need something a bit more high fidelity uh, to pitch to producers and so on. Um, then next we have vehicle and transportation design. And this was done by Sparth, which if you don't know, he's the art director on Halo. And he's been working at huge titles during his career, like uh, uh, Dune and uh, uh, Quake, I think, and some other Ubisoft games. He was actually on the team for the first Assassin's Creed game ever. So this guy is super versatile. And uh, you know he knows perspective by heart, so he can just design these things without even drawing a grid or anything like that. And of course, there's people that do the same thing with semi 3D stuff, painting on top of a model, or then they could just go full 3D and, and do something that is basically game ready in a sense. And then the 3D artists of the team actually have to optimize the geometry that they have at their disposal to actually put it in the game and make it so that the game engine doesn't crash. Uh, so people also specialize in what it's called car surface design, these type of 3D people. And uh, I guess it's much more focused on product and mechanical or industrial designing. Uh, so basically knowing enough basics in these fields, uh, how mechanisms work and so on, uh, it makes you able to create functional and believable looking assets, which is more or less what I'm doing for the Doom project. We're working on a, a lot of sci-fi elements and vehicles and flying machines and, and so on. So you need to do stuff that looks cool, but also looks real. And maybe only bike experts would tell you that something, engineering experts, I mean, would tell you that something doesn't work at all. All the other people that have like a superficial understanding of how these things work, they might just say, cool, okay, I believe these things uh, exist in that fictional world. And that's really uh, the point. And the same goes with weapon design. 
this again was done for Halo, which you think, okay, it's a massive uh, AAA project. Uh, at this point, they don't need to the artists anymore. But no, like if you're a good enough designer, you can do whatever you want. Uh, this is still good production work for for a game like that. And again, you could do the total opposite and go completely wild in 3D and try to create the same thing uh, at a much more advanced level. Uh, of course, the same applies to environment design. Uh, this is the same guy that did the weapon that I was showing you before, I think. And you think, okay, environment design for concept art uh, in video games might be those beautiful uh, painted landscapes with deserts and all that stuff and the stickment in the forefront, you know, the usual thing. But no, actually, this is much more uh, what you get to do if you work for a company like that. Just, uh, I guess this is for a multiplayer map and you can barely see like the game design blocky version of the map that was underlined. But at some point when they defined where the blocks are and how the uh, the players move in the map and it all works. They basically ask us to do set dressing, which is making the blocks look cool, pretty much. And uh, and of course, this comes in a variety of different uh, techniques. Like this was done for a multiplayer map. So this is the most efficient way to do it, especially if they give you like a screenshot of the map they want you to overpaint. But then again, this for Destiny, I guess they were trying to establish the look of the social hub area in the tower. And uh, I guess they didn't have much uh, stuff done at the time. So this is just a super basic 3D pavement. And this guy just used a bunch of uh, photo bashing, which is photo manipulation mixed with paintings uh, to create like almost this more immersive feeling. Like it's almost like you're seeing a, a player experience. Uh, somehow. Uh, then next, uh, keyframe and concept illustrations. Uh, I don't know why it's still matte paintings. I change it with concept illustration. Matte paintings are something else. Uh, so I guess this is the type of artwork that is more uh, popular. Like if you look at concept art or this type of thing on Google, this is the type of artwork that would come out like a very well done painting that has a lot of atmospheric elements about it and there's a lot of storytelling involved and so on uh, this is either done in the pre-production phase of the work like to pitch the idea to the investors to the producer like to have everyone on the same level and and you know be inspired about the project uh, and it's also like what comes into art books later on and gets published and they could even do these type of things as the last art the game when everything is established and the game already exists uh, they could ask these guys to do just like promotional art uh, just because it looks so cool um, and this is done by Craig Mullins which is like the, the best digital painter ever like he started doing it in the 90s he established all the uh, techniques that we currently use in digital painting just because he's a he's a genius uh, but of course there's people that uh, use a more, bit more mixed techniques. Uh, this guy, Sanchoi, uh, is more about painting with photos, like I was showing you before. It's a bit sharper in that way and has a bit uh, easier composition to understand, but the quality is overall, like I would say the same. They're both amazing. Um, or some people just go full 3D. Like if, you, if you're familiar with the concept art from uh, The Last of Us and The Last of Us 2, and Naughty Dog, One Pixel Brush, they're all studios that have a very high standard for these type of uh, concept illustrations. So this might be just them trying to understand how to create the set, uh, the look of this room, but they really want something that looks photorealistic, as close to the game as possible. And they do it obviously because it's easier for any other uh, person in the team to go on and expand on this but also because they have a huge market on their concept art. They're not just throwaway artworks that go in the garbage after they, they are being used by designers and so on. They, if, you, if you're familiar, indeed, they use it as an extra content for the game and they do art books and they sell really well. Like it's a, this thing is a little product in its own right. Uh, 
then yes, yeah, so you might have noticed uh, in any case that for any of these subjects, there's a ton of research work to be done uh, to create something that feels believable and, and credible other than just looking cool. And for me personally, that's really the cool thing about this job uh, is that as a concept designer, we can really become some kind of superficial expert if you want in anything that interests you. Uh, architecture, modern cars, uh, NASA stuff, weapons, uh, fashion design, home products, whatever interests you. Uh, or also cinematography. If you're a huge fan of cinema, a keyframe artists uh, focus especially on storytelling and they're all about studying composition and lighting in movie shots uh, to become experts in, in what they do, obviously. In other words, um, even when you're not designing or doing research, it's all about observing the world around you. Uh, any object or building that you see has been designed with a purpose and a logic behind it. And that translates into a visual language. And I'm not talking just about man-made objects, even nature, if you think about it. And how many human objects have been inspired by nature? Like you might see leaves on the ground and you might think, okay, this looks like a Arabic sword. This is not a coincidence, like the shapes that work in nature that, that feel elegant are the same ones that humans use to create their objects if they have enough skill to do so. Um, and this is the first step, like this, you have to get into this mindset. It's more about the mindset and the technique comes afterward. And as cheesy as it sounds, like uh, you have to let the world around you teach you design in one sense. Uh, the theory written in books, design, design theory, I mean, it's just an additional mental scaffolding, if you want, to help you understand things that are really just comprehensible with your intuition, if you're uh, looking good enough at the world around you. Uh, so besides this more philosophical considerations about the job, uh, this is really like how, what, you should study if you want to get into this uh, field and the importance of each one of these. Uh, there is a lot uh, of training to be done to develop the basic techniques and design skills that are needed for this. Uh, and this is what the pyramid is here to tell you. Uh, first and foremost, most important are the fundamentals, which I mean, uh, by which I mean art fundamentals, uh, knowing how to draw and to quickly represent ideas in a way that is clear for everyone. Uh, you might, doing, might be doing this with pencil and paper or with just a Photoshop and Wacom tablet uh, or painting, uh, but you need to know all these things on the spot, like color and light theory, anatomy, perspective, and so on. And you need to practice these things enough so that when you start learning about design, uh, you're not struggling about technique anymore. Like you're just freely thinking about ideas and you can think about whatever you want. You, you can think about, okay, what if I do like a plane that looks like a turtle in the sense of the, the way the proportions work and the shape language works. If you, if you have all these skills in check, like this is just, a, uh, the task is really just letting your imagination run free and finding cool shapes. If you don't, if you lack fundamentals, you're basically most of the times uh, subtracting ideas just because you think you're not capable to do them. If the more fundamentals, the more basic skills that you have, the stronger your fundamentals are, the more you can be crazy with design. And that I think is the, when people should start uh, learning design when they have practiced uh, fundamentals for at least some months. And finally, style uh, is something that shouldn't be researched too early on in the development uh, of the studies, uh, because that would result in you copying even just uh, subconsciously other people's work and potentially taking away much of your original takes on the subject. So style uh, is like your own footprint in a way. And it, it really emerges gradually. And I see like lots of people, lots of students, even the people that apply the portfolio uh, to the company. Uh, it's like they're trying to mimic somebody else's work or it's like they, um, 
they're lacking in some basic skills, but their lack of skills becomes somehow their trademark. And it's, it, they don't see it as a flaw. They think, okay, this is how I do stuff. This is my footprint. Whereas it might just be that they don't know how to draw circles, draw circles maybe. And that's like, okay, no, that's my style. My heads are particularly small in the characters that I do. That, that's bullshit, honestly. Like people should really start focusing on the fundamentals. And then eventually the style comes by itself. And it's really just about uh, having this humbling experience every day. You wake up, you think uh, you're a really, really, really crappy artist. And that's actually the days in which you're learning. When you feel like you're the best one in the world, that's when you're stalling, honestly, from my experience. <laughs> um, yeah, these were just like an additional slide to talk about fundamentals. Uh, to be a bit more specific, yeah, uh, in drawing, this could, the fundamentals could be broken apart in three parts, uh, which is like perspective, uh, line quality, and speed, uh, which is just doing sketches like these ones and working more, knowing more and more or less how the light works, so you can project shadows and make highlights and stuff like that. And then next on you have painting, which is basically trying to get one of these things and paint it in this way, so it looks a bit more vibrant and realistic. So it's all about coral light, I guess even composition, because this is a, a sheet on its own. And presentation is also very important. If you study or if you have studied graphic design, uh, it's basically the same thing. Like you need to know some rules uh, to be able to present the work in the best possible way. Uh, and then after you know how to do these things, uh, you might get into 3D, which is basically a way to speed up this stuff a lot. Like if you look at how people were doing concept art in the 90s, uh, like I don't know, the Star Wars prequels or any game from the early 2000s it was all about this and people they would hire armies of people that were able to do this uh unless the only people able to do this were american first at that time i mean and they attended this school in california which is called the art center which if any of any of you knows uh, charges like 100k a year to attend just to study industrial design with these people that teach you this type of stuff so let's say things have become a bit more democratic uh, there since. And, uh, and 3D, I think, and techniques like Photoshop and digital painting and VR sculpting, uh, they facilitate techniques for people that can't afford to stay for such a long time in a facility and trained in this way. So what emerges is actually just the original ideas of, of people like that want to be designers. Maybe you're a super talented comic artist and you might be a super awesome concept artist as well. Or maybe drawing isn't really your thing, but then you're very good at designing stuff and 3D might be the solution. Like it's way easier to uh, make shapes interact and apply textures and stuff like that. There's such a vari variety in styles of concept artists nowadays rather than there was uh, 15 or 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. It was, it was all about digital painting 10 years ago still. Speaking about softwares, uh, I would say at this point in time, it's crucial for a concept designer to know at least the basics of 3D. So the must-haves are uh, Photoshop and Blender, which is what I use, uh, just because it's free, like, you know, the debate, obviously. Uh, but people like, Maybe they started studying before and they are custom with 3ds Max or any other 3D package, like you can choose whatever. Um, and I say at this point in time, because uh, as you know, technology runs super fast in this field and people switch from one software to another in the matter of a couple of years, uh, just because some things uh, make the workflow so much quicker and easier, as I was telling you. Um, so for instance, like, uh, I've stopped using some softwares and I started using some other ones just in the time span that I've been, I've been at Funko. And the whole workflow, uh, workflow of the whole company has been updating constantly just to be faster and more efficient. Uh, but yeah, apart from the two main ones, 
I guess the other softwares that I use are Fusion 360, which uh, it's almost like AutoCAD. It's a CAD software. And uh, I guess it's also used in engineering to do uh, uh, mechanical parts and moving parts. And it has a good uh, way of simulating physics for uh, like the uh, structural integrity of the structures of the building and stuff like that. But that's more the advanced part. Uh, let's say it's just very versatile and precise when it comes to modeling mechanical uh, stuff. Uh, and then actually I try to put them in the order, uh, like in the importance, right? The most that I use is Blender, then Photoshop to finish up stuff or to do sketches. Fusion is like an alternative to Blender most times. And then there are these two softwares, uh, which are Gravity Sketch and uh, Oculus Medium which are both for uh, virtual reality. We try to uh, introduce uh, virtual reality sculpting into the studio, uh, me and another colleague of mine. And it worked pretty well because uh, it's immensely powerful just to be able to uh, be in the same room you're designing. If you're designing a room or hold the rifle you're designing in your hands, if you're designing a rifle, like you're literally holding it and designing the scope in front of you and you can test different camera angles or rotate it around and zoom a lot on the on the details and it's it's much more immediate than if you're drawing it or even if you're just doing a 3d version of it and these softwares are a bit different from one another uh, this is more like a, a vol a vector driven in a sense it creates shapes it creates lines but it's not really uh, geometry sculpting like you would have in Blender. They have like a basic version of that, but it's not really the same thing. And if you go check their page on Instagram, you see that they're basically trying to focus a lot on product design. Uh, like they're mainly doing cars and shoes just because the organic shapes are, are super easy. Like imagine you have two, uh, two joysticks in your hands, the, the controllers for the VR set. And you, you move your hands and you can create surfaces depending on how you inclinate your wrists and elbows. And it's super precise doing that. And that would take like much more time uh, trying to move the vertices in the 2D space of a, of a 3D software, for instance. And Medium is a bit more, uh, it's still VR, as I was saying, but it's a bit more like ZBrush, if you know it. Uh, it's not modeling, it's called uh, sculpting just because it simulates uh, clay sculpting. Uh, there's this technology called voxel, uh, which basically projects a grid of tiny, tiny squares on the geometry, depending on how uh, big or small resolution you want to have. So uh, it's really precise and you can cut it with different shapes or negative shapes and create uh, more complex stuff, but it's more indicated for organic things. Uh, but you can also have like a list, a, a tiny library of stamps, like literally like Lego, like you have 12 different pieces of different forms and sizes and you can put them together. And like I've, I've done countless designs for this uh, game just by putting together spheres and uh, rectangles and I don't know, triangles as a base. And then if that thing works, then you can just start detailing on top of it. But so many ideas are just done by placing very basic volumes in the space and make it work. Uh, like this is a bit of a digression but on, on design theory, but if you think about the Star Destroyer or the Millennium Falcon, they're super iconic designs, but they're all super simple shapes, right? They might be super detailed on the surface because of course they need to look huge and believable and, and realistic. But they're just super simple shapes because they need to be recognizable and iconic on the screen. Uh, then, yeah, we have ZBrush, which uh, I'm sure some of you know because uh, it's the famous software with which you sculpt uh, creatures and faces. And it's very chill. Like, even if you don't want to become a concept artist, you can just download the trial version and start moving around the clay ball. It's very fun. And any intuitive, there's a lot of tutorials for each one of these softwares anyway, at this point. Uh, Substance, uh, which is like a, a list of different softwares, but it's basically just for uh, texturing. 
right? If you know about the technology in texturing, uh, until some years ago, it was really technical, like you had to uh, create a 3D model and then unwrap the geometry, which is basically open it like a, the, the shell of an orange, let's say, on a piece of paper and then project the images that you wanted to have as a texture on top of that flat surface, uh, which is what 3D artists uh, still do with the help of some tools. But for concept artists that need to create stuff very, very quickly, and it might not even be super accurate at times, uh, this software is super useful because it literally uh, lets you paint on top of geometry. Like if you're painting on Photoshop, you do the same thing on a 3D surface and you move your uh, uh, your 3D model around, like you, you rotate it and you say, okay, I'm doing a dog and I want his nose to be slightly more black than the body. And then I don't know, the subsurface scattering behind their ears is going to be uh, slightly red. And you know, it's, it's just painting on top of 3D model. It's amazing. Uh, and then I guess Quixel and Unreal Engine are uh, go hand by hand in a way. Uh, the Doom game we're doing runs on Unreal. Uh, they're like both versions of Unreal. They're trying to test it for, uh, if you know about Unreal 5 that it's coming out. Uh, they're really trying to test it on both uh, platforms and see what's best. Uh, and Quixel is basically uh, a library of assets, and they have all been photo scanned by reality. And it's really amazing for, for concept art, because sometimes you're not just doing like a small object or a, or a design, but you also need to put it in a context, right, uh, to, make, to make it really read. Uh, if you're doing a chair, it might be cool to put it in one room and, and have some other stuff going around, like some... Uh, other furniture and so on. And Quixel really does that. It gives you like a huge library with different materials, like huge rocks, cliffs, but also pieces of sidewalks, I don't know, traffic lights, and anything you can imagine. These people have a team that went around the world with uh, photo scanning technology and did super high resolution versions of those objects. And uh, you can just import them into Blender with one click and you're basically just creating a small diorama of 3D stuff. And yeah, I, I put Unreal Engine as a separate uh, software because actually uh, it might not be a super uh, known thing, but also concept artists need to use the engine from time to time. It's not that just something that uh, uh, that is for coders and uh, designers and 3D artists. Uh, mainly just because it's cool to see how the stuff that you design looks in the games. And Basically, any concept artist that I know at this point knows more or less how to handle 3D. And especially if you're doing like a big piece of machinery or a vehicle or whatever, it's super immediate to just upload it to the engine and see it in the environment that is already there. Like, of course, I don't think I'm spoiling anything if I say that in our game, there's going to be a desert, even though it has not been announced. But, you know, there are some really cool dunes and rock cliffs and stuff. And it's really cool to just place the white, gray, block out version of your model and having moving around in the world. And uh, it's, it's refreshing to see, like, how it would look eventually in the final game. Uh, it's a bit deceiving just to see it on a 2D flat surface all the time. And, and by the way, like, I've seen people especially keyframe concept artists starting to use Unreal 5 as a uh, designing software, not just to test stuff into the game. Like it has some amazing lighting uh, capabilities and it's much more fast than uh, the rendering uh, parts of Blender or Keyshot or any other rendering software. So people just use the Quixel library and some models that they design, they just put it in Unreal 5 and they just move them around they create cool compositions. Then they put a camera and they're almost like creating a set and being a director. And uh, there is one more software that I didn't put in this presentation just because I, I sort of wanted to start that discussion with you guys, if you, if you agree, uh, which is AI art. Recently, there have been these uh, softwares coming out. They've been around for a couple of years, but right now they've reached a point where they're really doing stuff that looks uh, painterly and, and cool, like done by a professional artist. If you know about them, 
one of them is called uh, uh, circle diffusion and the other one is mid journey and they're basically uh, just prompt based uh, mid journey especially it's like a discord server like you put a hashtag and you type the the sentence that you want to have as an output painting like a sunny mountain a, a sunny valley with mountains and green trees and maybe you also specify the style that you wanted it like maybe studio ghibli painterly style watercolor whatever and this thing actually outputs four different images in that style that might look a bit crappy but as soon as you get the handle of how to uh, design the words and how to put sentences together you can really replicate some cool um, some cool paintings at least uh, thumbnails if you know like the, the super small uh, initial phases of a painting for concept art and there's a huge debate going on right now even we're trying to push this uh, to be adopted uh, by the company just because we could have like so many fast ideas uh, in little, little time. Uh, the question on the chat, do you think in 10 years your job can be in danger? Uh, I really don't think so. Like if I have to be really honest, I think 3D artists are much more in danger just because concept artists are learning how to be 3D artists. Like I and my colleagues can do 3D models that are basically finished. And the only, the only, purpose of a 3D artist is basically just to optimize what we do. But the difference between us and 3D artists is that we know how to design, like we studied a lot of time to, to learn that language. Uh, but they don't, like 3D artists start working in the industry just uh, thinking about, okay, I, I, I have a blueprint of a concept and I need to replicate it as uh, uh, the same looking as possible. Like it needs to be I need to create what the concept artist tells me to create. So what happens if concept artists know how to 3D model? It means that either 3D modelers know how to design as well, or they're being outclassed by concept artists. And, uh, and the thing is that AI, as much as it could be advanced, you can't really uh, replicate uh, the versatility of a designer in that sense. Like, imagine, a concept art is not just about doing uh, a steady series of variation and then you come to the final results. Like, I don't know, maybe you're doing a spaceship and there are some very tight gameplay requirements. Like, uh, I don't know, you need the landing gear to be this wide and there needs to be some type of sockets for other vehicles to be uh, attached and then uh, lifted into the bigger vehicle or machine guns need to be here on the side. You can't just have a 3D artist to place a machine gun on the side of a huge spaceship uh, because it would look awkward if it doesn't know how to design. And you can't tell an AI to make it look cool because the AI, at least now, the only thing that can do is create fast ideas. But when it comes to technicality and, and putting things together for the final version of the game, you need a designer. Otherwise, things look awkward and they, they don't look final, let's say. Uh, the way I think about AI is that it's going to be a, a massive uh, help for concept artists. Like if you think about projects that took eight years to, to be completed, like some massive uh, open world game, the same thing right now uh, could be done in like, I don't know, five years less, just because every concept artist becomes like a tiny art director, just because the AI is like an army of concept artists at his disposal. Like with the velocity, this thing can create artworks. I, I basically have like five people working for me that create super fast sketches. And then I can decide, okay, I go forward with this one or with that one. I skip completely this whole phase so I can, I can actually be even more creative because I don't get to spend two weeks on one single idea or concept. I might uh, decimate that time and projects get released faster and I get to work on more stuff and my portfolio is bigger. So I, I'm really excited about it, actually. Like I'm, I'm not fearing it in any way. Uh, but yeah, I guess the presentation is finished. And I know like there was like one last 15 minutes for questions. So 
if you guys want to ask something. I know there's another one. Uh, did you manage to develop such a unique art style? What are your reference? How did you manage to develop? Uh, oh, uh, I, I think this question was for a previous uh, ah, okay. presentation. All right. No, I think it was for the previous slide, no? Yeah, because I was talking about style. If it's yeah. still relevant, I can just answer quickly. Like, uh, I think like any other creative job, like you just uh, become like a mix of uh, your main influences. And you know, if you're not really into researching other people's work and you just like, and you're a musician and the only guy you like is uh, Bruce Springsteen, if you do your own album, like you might sound, you might sound like him eventually. But if you have a ton of different artists uh, and you listen to a lot of stuff and you're always constantly looking for new stuff, uh, stuff gets um, your influences become smaller and more scattered and more nuanced. So your style might actually be uh, a mosaic of different uh, influences from different artists. But since the resolution is so small and you're actually using your creativity to rearrange of all these small tiles, the, the output, the results that, that comes out is actually super unique just because you have been rearranging it. So I guess it's almost like a mathematical thing. Like the more influences you have, the more uh, it's probable that your creativity will rearrange this whole thing into something unique. And that's what I think about uh, when I say footprint. Like it's so your way to reinterpret reality and the things that you like about reality, especially other artists. And uh, and some people have like a very unique style just because they probably just because they care about it, just because they want to be different uh, from other artists. Or some others just have it uh, as a side effect of working in making their own choices. It's like style is a is a result of the choices that you make uh, while designing, which might be like a preference in certain type of shapes or colors, or even just the the tiny little differences that there are between anyone's uh, workflow. Like some people might like to use more contrast, and some others are more like in the mid range. You know, like it's subtle difference, but if if you put them one on top of the other, it builds up and creates very different books. So uh, I have a question just to go back to the AI part because I, I thought that was like really interesting and I had no idea that they were so advanced. Yeah. So the, the one you mentioned, open my open mind AI, right? Something like that? It's no, like I, can, a, I can yeah uh, write it in the chat. Okay, okay, cool. So it's it's you can install it on Discord, like it functions as a bot, but it can generate like mid-journey, exactly. But yes. it it, um, it generates concept art on command, like with the prompt, correct? So it's you already, would yeah. use it. You would use it like as a starting point, no? So you had five different bots generating mm -hmm. ideas similar to the one that you wanted, but the drawback of AI is that you lose control. So you would use this as starting points, or could you like, oh, I like this drawing here. I'll try to edit it, or then, or should I improve the prompt that I'm giving to the system? So is that the way that you were t thinking of using it? And are you, is Funcom accepting that push that you guys have been trying to do of using those tools? Uh, yeah, to, to answer to the first part of the question, mm -hmm. the prompt actually gives you four different outputs and you can decide either to upscale one of them, uh, like bring it to a higher resolution or to have variations of it. But it's not really that it gives you variations. It's like maybe if you're lucky, it gives you a better output than the, the first one. That it gave you before, uh, and like I guess the best way is to show you guys uh, and people. It's not really just for concept art; it's for art in general. And some people might even do album covers or I don't know, uh, okay. graphic design stuff with it. Like you see that stuff that people do with it. Um, it's a bot that you install on Discord, and you can actually request access on Google. Like if you go on the website, uh, they will accept you in like uh, a couple of weeks, I guess. But you know, people just do shit all the time. Like this is nothing, but it's still, and it's kind of creepy as well. Uh, but if you know what to tell him, uh, like it's really cool. Like I, I could, I don't know. Uh, you could do, let me see. The prompt is imagine. 
and then it's like uh, a sunny canyon, the desert of Wadi Rum, beautiful painting by Rembrandt. And then you literally wait for like three minutes and it gives you four different options. Wow. But it's really generic. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I would be able to do anyway in like half an hour. Mm -hmm. But it already starts a conversation and you still need a technician to go further and translate this into a 3D scene. And mm -hmm. I don't know if an art director passes by and tells you, okay, but you know what? I would need like a very specific design for a staircase that goes all the way up to the canyon. Like you don't have an AI to create you a 3D model of a staircase that fits the style of Doom and, and everything, all the requirements that you need for this. So yeah, Funcom, I guess they're really excited about this mm -hmm. just because, uh, especially when it comes to creating new areas of the map, uh, this is the first thing that you do, like you blast out a lot of different composition ideas and you think, oh, okay, this could be a really nice point of interest. Uh, we might put like a crash, crashed spaceship on top of this cliff. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it saves some time, but it's not really intelligent yet. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for the answer. I just want to say that the present this presentation was really, really, really good. And I'm really happy that you came. Thank I you. Think Matt, uh, has another question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll keep this running in the background so you can creep it out. Okay. okay, okay. Out. <laughs> uh, do you go back and forth with your fundamentals? Uh, yes, actually, yeah. Uh, there's some people that are more serious about this than me, I guess. Like uh, people that like to stream their art session on Twitch, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's something that everyone should do, like just going back and do the basic exercises. And uh, you, it might just be drawing perspective uh, volumes in perspective and I don't know, trying to draw a tank in perspective or trees or buildings going around the city and sketch. That's also a way of res refreshing fundamentals if you want. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like some people think of fundamentals like something that, that you learn one time and then you switch to 3D and, and that's it. But I've noticed that uh, the more people have a strong grasp of the fundamentals, the more design uh, options they have in their mind. It's almost mathematical as well. Like it broadens their mind and they don't think that, like they're, they're literally having less ideas just because they're, they're think they're not, they think they're not able to do them or to realize them. So the stronger the fundamentals, the, the better designer you are potentially. And I guess somehow it's like kung fu, like you need to go back and practice the basic moves to, to become a master, if you want to see it this way. So it, it's like that pyramid that you showed, right? If you practice yeah, the bottom, a, then the everything thing. will move up. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and I guess like one way, like obviously it's not separated as that. I put it in a pyramid, but obviously all these things are happening together as soon as you start uh, studying the fundamentals. And some other very important thing you can do is actually do studies. Like as much as uh, old painters would go to the atelier or to the museum just to copy old masters. Like, I don't know, you had... Uh, people from Belgium coming all the way to Rome in the 16th century just to see Michelangelo and copy it. Not making a variation of it, just copy it to learn the technique. And somehow you do the same thing as a concept artist. Like you, sometimes you don't want to design anything. Uh, you're just copying someone else's work if you really like it, but mainly, I guess, real life references. And I don't know, you create a exact one-to-one -one copy of, uh, jet engine of a cool jet fight and then after you do that you have all these shapes in your mind and you know more or less how it works depending if you really want to dive into it and understanding how the mechanics work and so on but even if you don't do that like after you've done it um, you have that stuff in your mind and it basically becomes part of your visual library 
and that's another very important aspect of uh, of a concept artist uh, like having a list of different shapes and forms in your mind and being able to make them interact in a cool way to create uh, a nice looking result and that's sort of what uh, ai does for you in in a partial way at this point but if you think like i guess if you really know what it means and what's the complexity behind designing uh, you would realize that the idea of an ai being able to replicate that is simply insane like there's so many more variables that even just coding if you if you think about like the uh, the complexity of holding such a system together like why why is the design looking good there are like some resting space and some spaces uh, with more detail but then it's not a rule like it's just a guideline like why why does this look good obviously it's been built to shoot but then there's something that makes it look cooler than others uh, than other rifles that are maybe done by uh, intermediate artists or amateurs like there's a there's a resting space here and there all the details is concentrated here and then the shapes are very round but there's like a very specific ratio to the roundness and then all of this stuff you can make these graphic uh, considerations about the image but then obviously it's a piece of mechanic like it needs to work it's functional it's not that these shapes are done like this to be appealing it's just something that needs to shoot and uh, it's like different levers that you pull at the same time to, to have a result like this and i guess ai could just help to uh, help you to obtain something like this but uh, like you really need someone experienced to be able to do this. I don't know how to put it otherwise. And but but the AI, the AI is also an impersonation of something what that you said that you have to let the world around you teach you design. And the AI just does exactly that, right? It just takes a, a large amount of paintings or whatever information it's using to learn. Yeah. And then it imperson impersonates it, right? Yes, yes. But the design doesn't have taste unless they teach yes. the AI to have taste. Yes, and exactly. You can have taste as an element of uh, to distinguish one artist to another, but some projects have a taste as well. Like you're working for uh, The Last of Us, which is very realistic, but you might work for Overwatch, let's say. You might be the best designer ever, but you, you need to really fit into some style and, uh, and make some uh, creative choices about what you output as an artist so that it works in that universe and it doesn't feel out of place. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be coherent with the rest of the design. Yes, and that's much more nuanced uh, than, than what the AI is capable yeah, of. Yeah, and then the part. AI is unable to do that. It's like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Lukas has a question, I think. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, this was an amazing talk, very inspiring, so thank you for that. And my question, um, is about uh, design theory. I'm I'm pursuing concept art as well, and I I, I feel like I'm still at the fundamental uh, fundamentals uh, stage. But uh, design theory is a thing, is a subject that really intrigues me. Um, how did you uh, go about studying it? Did you um, was it an intuition uh, based study? Well, um, you try to feel your way through the design of various subjects, or did you uh, study about some some rules and some uh, actual theory about it? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess if you go to schools like private schools that tell you, okay, I'm going to teach you concept art, uh, the main thing that they do is teaching you design for concept art without teaching you design as a, as a thing on its own. So it's like they're already in the mindset of doing silhouettes and variations and, and it all looks gamey in a way, if you know what I mean. Like it's, it's like you're emulating already stuff that you're doing for games. But when you see something that looks good in a game and becomes iconic and instantly recognizable, it's for sure people that design that thing took inspiration from real life, not from another game, or not even from a mix of other games. It always comes from real life. And, uh, 
and I guess, yeah, if you really want to broaden your scope and, and learn design in a different way, it's really just about try to see what they study at product design or uh, design history or art history, stuff like that. It might not be like a really, really a list of uh, stuff that you need to know, like rules of thirds and, and how to fit the circle in a page and all these things. They might be more generic, but they, they, they can also tell you where to look at. Uh, but of course, if you want something more specific, like there is a ton of uh, different uh, tutorials on the internet. I can give you like a very specific one for art service, for instance, that uh, we started using for concept artists that joined the company here. Uh, visual Design Basics by Alex Seneca. It's a Gumroad course. I believe it's free. So if you go on Gumroad, you can download it. It's uh, it's like a course. It's structured like uh, with a bunch of theor theoretical slides at the beginning, but then at, at the end he uses uh, Fusion 360 to design a, a rifle, trying to uh, go back on all the techniques that he talked about and putting them in practice. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. Because uh, it's also midday. I don't know if we have more time. Uh, I'm just checking, and I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much for this amazing presentation and for being here with us and for replying to all these questions. Thank you for inviting. <laughs> so, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. This is great. <laughs> is there any way to contact you afterwards uh, if anyone has any questions after the whole session? Uh, yeah, sure. I can give you my Instagram account, I guess, because okay. uh, the email is already pretty cluttered. <laughs> uh, also, Manuel had uh, the hand raised. I don't know if it's... Oh, no, no, I, I was clapping, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is my uh, Instagram account, or hmm. even if you type my name, I guess it would come out. I don't think many other people are called like me, so it won't be that hard. Okay, so we'll be sure to share it uh, in the Discord of our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you again. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, you Thank too. You. Bye so bye. this concludes our session for today, and this concludes our last session for the school year. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for being with us uh, for another school year. And well, uh, we wish you a very pleasant summer with uh, lots of game development, or at least uh, with games that you can play. And well, um, uh, as Paulo was saying, we will have the gathering and we will have, we'll be at Montreux Jogs uh, next Monday. So we'll see you there and uh, yeah, have a great summer. Bye Ooh. guys. <laughs> see you.